بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Inshallah, we'll get right into the questions and answers for today. The first questioner is asking, if three divorces are given in one sitting, is that considered a sin? Giving three divorces at one time is considered a sin. And it defeats the whole purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving a person a number of chances to reconcile after a person gives a divorce. So if a person gives one divorce, then he has the chance to take his wife back. And then if he gives a second divorce and then he regrets it, he has a a chance to take her back again. And then only after the third divorce is there no chance to get a reconciliation again. Except in the case if the woman remarries another man, and that marriage is consummated and then the husband either dies or he divorces her without this being planned out before. But if this happens, then it would be permissible for the first husband to remarry uh, the ex-wife again, right? But the whole purpose why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the multiple opportunities for reconciliation You give one divorce and then you have a chance to take your wife back. You give a second divorce, you have a chance to take her back. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who has all wisdom. And He knows that sometimes a person may give a divorce due to some reason, but then when He has a chance to think about it, He feels that no, probably this wasn't the best thing to do and I want to take my wife back. And He takes His wife back and Alhamdulillah, they live fine after that. And this can happen maybe a second time even. And then he realizes that no, he wants to fix things and he wants to continue this relationship with his wife and he takes her back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives this this opportunity. So if a person insists on giving three divorces all in one time, then basically it's like he's saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, I don't need these chances that you're giving me. I don't want these chances that you're giving me. I want to finish it all and I don't want any chance of reconciliation. Allah has given you the opportunity to change your mind and to reconcile. And by you doing three in one time, it's like you're telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't need this. I don't need what you have given me, Ya Allah. This is very bad. So actually during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a person who did this. He gave his wife three divorces in one time. And this came to the attention of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet ﷺ was informed that there was a man who divorced his wife and he gave her three divorces all at once. And it is mentioned that when the Prophet ﷺ heard this, فَقَامَ غَضْبَانًا That he stood up and he was angry. وَقَالْ أَيُلْعَبُ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَا بَيْنَ أَظْهُرِكُمْ The Prophet ﷺ, he got up and he was angry and he said, Is the book of Allah being played with while I am still amongst you? People are playing with the rules of Allah, with the book of Allah while I'm still here? And the Prophet ﷺ, he was so angry that one of the companions actually even asked the Prophet ﷺ, should I go and kill him, Ya Rasulullah? So you can see how serious of a matter this is. So of course it's not permissible to give three divorces at one time. This is completely haram. Okay, but if a person did it, if a person gave three divorces in one time, it's haram for sure. There's no difference of opinion on that. This is not permissible. But there is a difference of opinion regarding whether it counts as actually three divorces or does it only count as one. If somebody gave his wife three divorces in one shot, does it count as three and the marriage is completely finished and there's no chance for reconciliation or does it only count as one. So there is some difference of opinion of the ulama regarding this. The majority of the scholars, including the opinion of all of the four madhahib, the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So the majority opinion here is that it counts as three. A person gave three divorces to his wife in one time. It's haram. He committed a sin and it also counts as three. 
So he cannot reconcile with his wife. The divorce is a final divorce, according to the majority opinion. Then there's another opinion, which is a minority opinion, but it is an opinion that actually holds a lot of weight, that even though it is haram for sure to give three divorces at one time, it would only be counted as one. So the person can still uh, reconcile with his wife. It would only count as one. It would not count as three. And this was the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, and some of the other scholars. And the reasoning behind this is that during the time of the Prophet wasallam, of course, if somebody did this, as we mentioned in the previous hadith, the Prophet wasallam got angry. And of course, it's haram for sure. But during the time of the Prophet wasallam, if somebody did, did this, it would be counted as one divorce. This is from the hadith of Ibn Abbas where he mentioned that if somebody gave three divorces to his wife in one sitting during the time of the Prophet وسلم, it was counted as one divorce and also during the time of Abu Bakr it was counted as one divorce and in the beginning of the Khilaf of Umar ibn Khattab it was also counted as one divorce but then Umar ibn Khattab he started to see people abusing this he started to see people doing it a lot they started to take this very lightly and they would give three divorces in one time. It became too common. So Umar radiallahu anhu, in order to stop this, this evil practice, he said from now on anyone who gives three divorces to his wife in one time, we're going to separate them. We're going to separate them and we're going to count it as three. And the reason why he did this was to stop the people from taking this matter lightly. Because the people started doing it too easily. They started doing it too regularly, even though it's something that is clearly haram. So he wanted to put a stop to that. So he said, anyone who does that, we're going to count it as three and you will be completely separated from your wife. So Umar radiallahu anh, for that reason, he would count three divorces done in one time as three, as a final divorce, not as one. Right? So that is why the majority of the scholars, they kept that practice of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, and they say that a person who divorces his wife with three divorces, it counts as three. But the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, even though it's a minority opinion, it's an opinion that holds a lot of weight because it actually goes back to what was done during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That of course, it is something that is haram, it is not permissible, but if a person does it, it does not count as three, it does count as one. And it seems that this opinion of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is the stronger opinion. That if a person does this, he should be asked to repent because he committed a sin by doing this. But the divorce would not count as three divorces, rather it would count as one. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Next question is asking, is Islamic financing that is offered in the US completely halal if we were to utilize it to purchase a home? So there are different companies who specialize in you know, Sharia compliant uh, financing, right? And they have different structures. So some of them, you know, may be okay in some aspects and they may be problematic in other aspects, right? And others may have some aspects that are okay and other aspects that are not okay, right? You have to look at each contract uh, individually. And there's actually uh, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, AMJA. They researched this matter in detail. They researched a number of the companies that offer this type of Sharia compliant financing. They looked at the contracts in detail and they mentioned what contracts have uh, true Sharia com compliant financing. And they mentioned that if there, if there were any issues or if there were any problems or if there were any parts of the contract that were not Sharia compliant, they mentioned that as well. So they looked into all of these or most of these financial institutions that offer Sharia compliant financing and they did a detailed analysis of each one. Right? So you can look at that fatwa. Uh, it is on the website of the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, AMJA. So if you just go into Google and you type uh, AMJA uh, 
uh, housing fatwa. You will find that fatwa that, that mentions all of these institutions and it mentions the type of contracts that they have and it mentions what is Sharia compliant and what is not Sharia compliant. It mentions what is permissible to get involved in and what is not permissible to get involved in. So there's a very detailed uh, analysis based on the research of these scholars uh, regarding these financial institutions. So I would advise you to go and take a look at that. Go to uh, AMJA. The website of AMJA, uh, Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, or go into Google and type AMJA, Housing Fatwa, and inshallah you'll find that fatwa and hopefully it will be able to answer your questions. Next question is asking, is buying and selling stocks halal? I have heard that if we were to buy stocks of companies that deal in selling halal products, we still have to look for other factors and look at certain ratios such as debt to asset ratio because these companies have outstanding loans to repay. Can you please highlight this issue in detail as to what factors one should look for before buying stocks? Okay, basically if you're buying stocks in a company, you're, you're buying, a, you're buying a, a, a share of ownership into that company, right? So you have to make sure that that company is a legitimate company. You have to make sure that that company is a company that's business is halal, right? So that's the main thing. If you want to invest in stocks, you have to make sure that the company that you're buying stocks from is a, is a company that, that's business is halal. And also you have to make sure that that company is not involved in haram activities. You have to make sure that that company is not dealing with interest, that it's not dealing with other haram things as well, right? So if you can ascertain this, then inshallah it would be permissible to buy stocks in that company. And there's actually a, a, uh, an investment uh, consulting firm called Wahid Investments. Wahid Investments, and they do all of this work for you. You know, they research the companies and they only choose the companies that are involved in halal businesses and are not involved in any uh, haram type of activity and they give you you know if you want to if you want to join them and you want to have a portfolio with them they hand pick the stocks for you and they make sure that all of these stocks are compliant with the principles of islam so it's called wahid investment so you may you might want to look at that go online and check that and uh, alhamdulillah they have been uh, they have been endorsed by a number of scholars alhamdulillah that uh, you know the the service that they are that they are providing inshallah it is compliant with uh, the principles of Sharia Next question is asking I'm working at a 7-Eleven where there is alcohol as an employee I have to ring up people who buy beer and other alcoholic drinks is my income haram if yes what should I do selling alcohol or you know even if you're a cashier and you have to ring up the alcohol this is haram and any income that is earned through this is haram income because of the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where he said, "Inna Allah ida harama shay'an harama thamana." Surely, when Allah subhanahu wa taala makes something haram, He makes the price of that thing haram as well. So He makes selling that thing haram as well. The income that is earned from selling something that is haram to consume, that income is haram as well. So working here, where you ha where you would have to ring up beer and alcohol and this and any other type of haram activities, or any other type of haram products uh, this is not permissible and you need to look for you need to look for another job you need to look for another job and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make it easy for you next question is asking I have a couple of books called Panj Surah this book has a lot of surahs and duas which are authentic but it also has some chapters which are not from the Quran or Hadith and seems to me as acts of shirk or bid'ah what should I do with this book I don't want to keep it either all right, so I, I have not, you know, I, I don't know exactly what is contained in this book. So I can't tell you whether it's okay or not because I have not seen the book and I don't know what it contains. Uh, but in general, if you want to dispose of a book that may have verses of the Quran or the name of Allah and you want to dispose of it in, uh, in a good manner that would not be disrespectful to the name of Allah or to the, to the surahs of the Quran, then it would be permissible to burn this type of a book. If you don't want to keep it and you, you, don't, you want to make sure that it's not disrespected, <coughs> then it is permissible to burn it. Uh, and this would not be considered a form of disrespect because this is, just a, this is actually a form of respect because you don't want it to, 
you know, you don't want to, I mean, you can't throw it away, obviously, and you can't put it in a position where it would be disrespected. So burning it would be one option. And actually, uh, Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu an, when he had the official mushaf uh, written, and there were many other copies that he wanted to dispose of, he ordered for those other copies to be burned. Right? So that there would be no confusion. So he had, he commissioned an official mushaf to be written. Right? And he made a few copies of that. And, of course, when we say he made a few copies of it, he had, he had a few copies written. There was, there was no such thing as a copy machine during that time, of course. But he had a few copies written. And as for any unofficial copies, he wanted to, any unofficial mushafs, uh, in order for there to be no confusion, he ordered for those unofficial mushafs to be burned. He ordered for them to be burned. And of course, this was not a form of, of disrespect, rather. This was something that was necessary to be done in order to avoid disrespect. Because if you, di if you dispose it in some other way, there is a chance that there may be some type of disrespect. So if you want to, uh, if you want to dispose of any item that has the name of Allah in it or that has verses of the Qur'an in it, you know, and you can't keep it and you want to dispose of it, then you can burn it. Another way of disposing of it is that you can put it in some type of a cloth and you can bury it in the ground, right? These are some ways of disposing of items that you, that you can't keep but that cannot be disrespected because they have the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or verses of the Qur'an in it. So this is what you can do, inshallah. Next questioner is asking, uh, in the last question and answer session, you explained about wudu over socks. Does the same ruling apply for hijab as well? As a sister, I have worn my hijab and I'm out all day. Can I run my fingers over my hijab for wudu? Okay, so basically doing mas over the khimar, over the, the headscarf. This is something where there is some difference of opinion of the ulama regarding. And the majority opinion is that, the majority opinion of, 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 of most of the madhahib including the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa uh, and a number of other scholars is that it is not permissible to wipe over the khimar. Rather, you know, it has to be removed and you have to wipe directly over the hair. Right? So that's the majority opinion. But there is another opinion and this is the opinion of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, uh, that it is permissible to wipe over the headscarf. That it is permissible for a woman to wipe over the headscarf and the, the evidence for that is that there is a narration where the Prophet وسلم, wiped over his imama. Prophet وسلم, he used to wear a turban, right? And there is a narration where the Prophet وسلم, did not remove the turban but he actually just wiped over it when he was doing wudu. So based on this narration, an analogy can be made to a sister who is wearing a khimar. Analogy can be made to a sister who is wearing a headscarf. So she can wipe over the headscarf as well, right? And the ulama who have allowed this, some of them have, have put a condition that it should be a type of head covering that's difficult to remove and put back on. Right? Like for example, a turban like the Prophet ﷺ was wearing. That is something that is wrapped multiple times, right? And it's difficult to, to take it off and then put it back on and wrap it again. It's, it's difficult to do that. So if it's something that's difficult to remove and put back on, then it's permissible to wipe over it. But if it's something that's easy to remove and put back on, like if it's just a regular cap, for example, this is so simple, you can just take it off and wipe over your head and put it right back on. It, so so the, the ruling would not apply to a simple cap like this. But if it's a, a turban that is wrapped around, then yes, this is difficult to remove and put back. So you can wipe over it. And the same thing applies for a, a, a woman's scarf. If a woman is wearing a scarf and, you know, she has it wrapped around, it's wrapped around her neck, right? And especially, you know, if she's in a public setting and, you know, if she takes it off, maybe there will be men around there that will see her and it's, you know, difficult to take it off and put it back on. So, inshallah, in this type of situation, it is permissible for a woman to wipe over her scarf, according to uh, the opinion of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And it is a strong opinion, even though it's not the majority opinion, it's a minority opinion, but it is supported by evidence. It is supported by this evidence that the Prophet ﷺ actually wiped over his turban. So, you know, using, using the same reasoning, we can say that a woman who's wearing a hijab or wearing a khimar that is wrapped around, it would be permissible, inshallah, for her to wipe over it instead of removing it. And there's no problem in doing that, inshallah. 
So it's permissible, inshallah. Uh, and the same conditions regarding wiping over the socks do not necessarily apply to a person who uh, to to a person who is wiping over their headwear. Like for example, wiping over the socks. One of the conditions for wiping over the socks is that when you put those socks on, you must have already been in a state of wudu. That you have to have worn those socks after performing wudu where you actually wash your feet. That's one of the conditions of wiping over the socks. That they must have been worn while you were in a state of wudu. Also, there's a time limit that you can only do it for one day and one night for the socks. You can wipe over your socks for one day and one night. And if you're a traveler, three days and three nights. So these are conditions that are attached to wiping over the socks. All right, so do these conditions apply to a person who's wiping over their headwear as well? A woman wiping over her, her headscarf? Does this condition apply? There is a difference of opinion here. Even amongst the scholars who said that it's permissible for a woman to wipe over her, her headscarf, there's a difference amongst them regarding the conditions. Do the same conditions of wiping over the socks apply or do they not apply? So some of the scholars said, you know, the same conditions would apply. Wiping over the socks, you have one day and one night and you have to have worn them in a state of wudu. So they say that the same condition applies for a person who's wearing uh, a scarf, a headscarf. But then there's another opinion that mentions that there is no such condition. That even if a woman wore her headscarf or even if a man wore his imama without wudu and then he wants to make wudu, he can wipe over it without removing it. And a woman who wore a headscarf without wudu and time comes and she has to make wudu, she can wipe over it even if she did not wear it in a state of wudu. And there's no time period that, you know, even if it's more than one day and one night, that if, if a woman has been wearing her khimar, her, her, her headscarf for more than one day and one night, it doesn't matter. She can still continue to make uh, mas. She can still continue to wipe over that. This is also one of the opinions of the scholars who have said that it's permissible. And it seems that this is the, this is the correct opinion. Because the narration that mentions that the Prophet ﷺ wiped over his imama, it doesn't mention any conditions. It doesn't mention any conditions. Whereas the narrations that mention about wiping over the socks, the conditions are mentioned. The conditions are mentioned. But as for wiping over the imamah, there's no condition mentioned. It's not mentioned that it has to be worn in a state of wudu. It's not mentioned that there's a certain time period and after that time period is over, you must remove it the next time you make wudu. There's nothing mentioned like that. So inshallah, the strongest opinion is that yes, a woman who is wearing a khimar, who is wearing a headscarf that is wrapped around her, right? It should, the, the scholars have said that one of the conditions that it should be wrapped around her neck. So the, the scarf that she's wearing, it should go around her neck, right? A woman who's wearing this type of a headscarf, she is allowed to wipe over it when she's doing wudu, even if she did not put it on in a state of wudu. Even if when she wore it, she did not have wudu. It's still permissible when it's time for her to make wudu. She doesn't have to remove it. She can wipe over it, inshallah. And there is no problem in doing that. And there's no time period. There's no time period. There's no limit. She can do it as long as she needs to do it, inshallah. All right. The next questioner is asking the proper method to do wudu. All right. So wudu is explained in the Quran. In the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu idha qumtum ila salati faghsilu wujuhakum wa aydiyakum ila al-marafiq wa msahu bi ru'usikum wa arjulakum ila al-ka'bayn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He commands those who believe that when you stand for prayer, wash your face, faghsilu wujuhakum, wash your faces, wa aydiyakum ila al-marafiq, and your hands and your arms up to the elbows, وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ And wipe over your head. وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنَ And wash your feet up to the ankles. Right? So, this ayah of the Qur'an, it mentions the obligatory parts of wudu. It mentions the obligatory parts of wudu. And then there are certain, certain additions to that from the sunnah. The sunnah way to make wudu that the Prophet ﷺ used to practice when he made wudu. So the way to make wudu is before starting wudu, you say Bismillah. You start in the name of Allah. 
So you say Bismillah and of course you have your intention in your mind that you're making wudu. You don't have to say anything in terms of your intention. The intention is in the heart. But you have that intention in your heart and you say Bismillah and you start your wudu. So it's sunnah. The first thing to do is to, to wash your hands three times. To wash your hands up to the wrists three times. Then after that, take a handful of water and put it in your mouth and also sniff some water up in your nose and then sniff it out or then blow it out. Sniff it up and blow it out. And it's better for this to be done uh, together, the mouth and the nose together. So you take, uh, you take a handful of water, you, you take some water into your mouth and you sniff some into your nose and you spit the water out from your mouth and you blow the water out of your nose and you do this three times and then you wash your face three times you wash your face three times and you make sure that your whole face is covered right from the top from where the hair starts right from the top of the forehead all the way down to the chin and if you have a beard make sure that the beard is also washed as well it's included in what you wash and from ear to ear make sure that your whole face is covered and you wash your face three times and then you wash your arms, including the hands. This is a mistake that some people make is that they don't include the hands. They think, okay, we already washed our hands in the beginning. Now for the arms, we just have to start from the wrist to the elbow. This is wrong. This is a mistake. Rather, it has to be the whole hand from the tips of the fingers all the way up to the elbows three times. And make sure that the water comes in between your fingers as well, right? So the, the hand and the arm up to the elbow has to be washed. So first the right hand and arm up to the elbow three times and then the left hand and arm up to the elbow three times, right? After that, then you will wipe over your head. You'll wipe over the head. And the sunnah way to wipe over the head is to basically you have your wet hands and you start from front to back with both hands, front to back and then back up to front again. So just go backwards and then go forwards, right? And then also it's sunnah to, to, wipe, uh, to wipe the ears as well. So on the inside of the ears and behind the ears. Inside of the ears and behind the ears. And this is not a full washing. This is just a, a, a wipe. Basically you wipe inside the ears and wipe behind the ears. Right? And then after that, the last part of the wudu is to uh, wash your feet. The feet should be washed top and bottom up to the ankle, including the ankle bone, right? That should be washed three times and make sure that you wash in between the toes as well. So three times the right foot and then three times the left foot. And this is the correct way to make wudu according to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And after you finish wudu, it is sunnah to say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirin So you say ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu and then you say Allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirin right and this is the the complete way to make wudu and inshallah we're actually planning on 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 making a, a video uh, inshallah we'll we'll be doing that pretty soon inshallah we're going to make a, a video on how to make wudu properly inshallah so uh, you know, just keep keep uh, looking at the the YouTube channel over the next few weeks, inshallah. We will we'll be coming out with a, a video on how to properly make wudu. All right. The next question is asking, what is the difference between fard, sunnah, and wajib? And what is sunnatul mu'akkada and sunnah ghair mu'akkada? All right. Regarding the words fard and wajib, according to most scholars, both of these words have the same meaning. Fard, it means something that is obligatory. And wajib also, it's something that is obligatory. What do we mean by obligatory in terms of fiqh? Something that is obligatory, according to the, the fiqhi definition, something that is obligatory is something that you must do. And if you do it, you will get rewarded for it. And if you do not do it, you will be punished or you are liable for punishment for not doing it. So what does, what does obligatory mean? Something that you have to do and you get rewarded for doing it and you are liable to be punished and you are committing a sin by not doing it. This is the meaning of wajib and fard, right? 
So according to, to most scholars, fard and wajib, it's the same thing, the same definition. That you have to do it, and you get reward for doing it, and you are committing a sin by not doing it. This is fard and wajib. In the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, there is a slight difference uh, between the meaning of fard and wajib. In the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, fard is something that is actually a stronger obligation than wajib. So fard is obligatory, and the obligatory is stronger than an, ob uh, than an obligation that is wajib. Like for example, according to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, the five daily prayers would be called fard. And of course, according to, to, to any madhab, the five daily prayers are considered fard. The two rak'at of Fajr, the four rak'at of Dhuhr, four rak'at of Asr, three rak'at of Maghrib, four rak'at of Isha. This is fard, right? But according to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, the witr prayer, the witr prayer is wajib. Wajib. So according to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, witr prayer is also obligatory. But the strength of that obligation does not reach the same level of the strength of the obligation of, for example, praying the two raka'at uh, of the fard of Fajr or the three raka'at of the fard of Maghrib, right? If you leave off the Maghrib prayer, you're committing a sin. And if you leave off the witr prayer, according to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa, you're also committing a sin. But the sin of leaving the Maghrib prayer is, is greater than the sin of leaving the witr prayer, right? So this is the differentiation of fard and wajib according to the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa. That the fard is, fard is stronger, a stronger obligation than wajib. Right? But they are both obligatory. Both of them you will get rewarded for doing it and both of them you will have a sin for not doing it. But fard is just stronger in terms of its, oblig in terms of its obligatory nature than wajib. This is the differentiation, slight differentiation. Uh, of the two terms in the madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa but according to the majority of the rest of the scholars fard and wajib it's the same thing so you can say for example you know the maghrib prayer is fard you can also say that it's wajib according to the majority of the scholars there is also one uh, opinion that some of the scholars of the Hanbali madhab have where they say that anything that is obligated in the Qur'an, anything that has been made obligatory in the Qur'an, we call this fard. And anything that has been made obligatory according to the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, we say that it is wajib. But the implication is the same. Meaning that both of these things are things that if you do it, you will get rewarded for it. And if you don't do it, you will have a sin written against you for not doing it. But the differentiation that some scholars of the Hanbali Madhab have made is that fard is referring to anything that Allah has mentioned in the Quran as obligatory. And wajib is anything that is mentioned as obligatory in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But for all practical purposes, the, the definitions are basically the same something that you must do and you will get rewarded for doing it and you will have a sin written against you for not doing it. This is fard and wajib. As for sunnah, sunnah, it, it basically means something that the Prophet ﷺ said or did or agreed with. So something that the Prophet ﷺ said, something that he ordered, something that he commanded. This is all from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. If the Prophet ﷺ commanded a person to do something, then this becomes sunnah. Also, if the Prophet ﷺ, even if he didn't say anything, but he did something, it was his practice himself that he used to do this, then that's also sunnah. And also, if the Prophet ﷺ, he gave his approval for someone doing something, even if he didn't do it himself, then that becomes sunnah. So if, for example, if a companion did something and the Prophet ﷺ, for example, asked him, why did you do this? And then he explains, I did it, Ya Rasulullah, because of this and this and this. And then the Prophet ﷺ approved of that. Or he didn't rebuke this person for that. He accepted that. Then that's also sunnah. So sunnah, it means anything that the Prophet ﷺ said, anything that he did, and anything that he approved of. These are all 
these are all from the uh, definition of the sunnah anything the prophet ﷺ said did or approved of this is sunnah <coughs> as for sunnah mu'akkada and sun, sunnah ghair mu'akkada sunnah mu'akkada it means a sunnah that the prophet ﷺ regularly did and he wouldn't leave them off he generally would not leave it off for example the two raka'at of sunnah before the fajr fard prayer the prophet ﷺ, he always used to do this he used to pray two sunnah before two fard of fajr and he used to do this all the time he wouldn't leave it off so those two raka'at are sunnah mu'akkada meaning a, a, a sunnah that the prophet sallallahu did regularly it's an emphasized sunnah and as for sunnah ghair mu'akkada it means the Prophet ﷺ, he would do it sometimes, but other times he wouldn't do it. He would do it sometimes, but other times he wouldn't do it. Like for example, praying before Asr, praying Sunnah before Asr. This is not Mu'akkada. There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, Rahimallahu imra'an salla arba'an qabl al Asr, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on a man who prays four raka'at before Asr, so four, four Sunnah before Asr. Right? But it's not mu'akkada. It's not something that the Prophet ﷺ constantly did all the time on a regular basis. You know, sunnah ghair mu'akkada. It means not, not something that is very strongly emphasized. It's not a sunnah that was done all the time. It means something that the Prophet ﷺ would do at times and he wouldn't do at times. This is what ghair mu'akkada means. Meaning not a strongly, it's a sunnah, but not a very strongly emphasized sunnah. Not something that you have to do all the time regularly. If you leave it sometimes, it's okay. But as for sunnah mu'akkada, it means the Prophet ﷺ, he would do it all the time. He wouldn't leave it. right? And he would make sure that he does it on a regular basis. As for something that is sunnah, in terms of fiqh, what does it mean, sunnah and fiqh? Sunnah, as we mentioned, it's anything that the Prophet ﷺ said or did or approved of that's the general definition of sunnah the practice of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the sayings of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the approvals of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but in terms of the fiqh definition it's a little different the fiqh definition it's it, it's referring to uh, a person who performs the sunnah what will he get out of doing that and what what would he get if he didn't do it this is what we mean by the fiqh definition. Like we talked about fard and wajib. We said that it's obligatory and if a person does it, he gets reward. If he doesn't do it, he gets a sin. Okay? Using the same type of, 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 of terminology or the same type of, 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 of def, uh, the same way to define sunnah, how would we define sunnah? Some, someone who does it, what does he get? Someone who doesn't do it, what does he get? Right? So sunnah in, in the fiqh definition it means something that if you do it if you do it you will get rewarded for it but if you don't do it if you don't do it you will not have any sin for leaving it off right so this is this is what what is called in fiqh as mustahab meaning something that is that is uh, that is recommended or that it's encouraged so sometimes you will hear the word sunnah for this when you're talking in fiqh terminology that okay this is not fard this is sunnah this is not fard but it is sunnah so what when someone is talking like this what does it mean that this is not fard but it is sunnah it means it's not obligatory but if you do it it's good and you will get a reward for doing it but if you don't do it if you don't do it, then there is no sin upon you. So this is strictly from a fiqh perspective. But, of course, if you're looking at it from a general perspective, the word sunnah, as we mentioned, it means something that the Prophet ﷺ said or what he did or what he approved of. And there could be situations where the Prophet ﷺ did something and it's an obligation to do that. So in this situation, in fiqh terminology, this would be fard, but in general terminology, it would also be sunnah. So what does that mean? For example, a man growing a beard, for example, a man growing a beard. 
This is something that from a fiqh perspective, from a fiqh perspective, it would be called wajib or fard. But from a general perspective, it would be considered sunnah. From a fiqh pers perspective, it would be considered fard. Meaning a person who does it will get rewarded for it. And a person who doesn't do it is committing a sin by not doing it. So from a fiqh perspective, the ulama have said growing a beard for a man, it is wajib or it is fard. But if you're looking at uh, a general definition, as we mentioned sunnah, it means something the Prophet ﷺ said or did or approved. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he grew a beard. It was, it was a practice of the Prophet ﷺ. It is something that he did. He grew a beard. So from that perspective, it is sunnah, meaning the Prophet ﷺ did it. It's something that he did. But from the fiqh perspective, it is we would say that it is wajib, that it is fard, because a person who does it will get rewarded for it, and a person who doesn't do it is disobeying the commandment of the Prophet ﷺ. So he is committing a sin by disobeying the commandment of the Prophet ﷺ. So you see, sometimes these words can actually be intertwined. Something that is fard or wajib, it can also be in general terms, it can be sunnah. But many times you hear people using the word sunnah uh, to basically describe something that is not fard. So that's why sometimes it, it gets confusing. Because like we said, sunnah, it, can, it has two, two types of definitions. A general definition and then a specific fiqhi definition. So sometimes people get those two definitions confused and they think, oh, okay, this is just sunnah, I don't have to do it. No, sometimes something is sunnah, but at the same time, from a fiqh perspective, it is also fard. It is sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ did it. But it's also fard because he commanded us to do it as well. Right? So sometimes the words can be intertwined. Right? So you have to, you have to be careful. When you, when you hear the word sunnah, you have to look at what, is, what, what definition is being meant here when when the word sunnah is being mentioned. Is, is it the general definition of sunnah or is it, is, is it the specific, specific fiqh definition of sunnah? So you have to be very careful about this because sometimes people may hear that, oh, this is just sunnah, I don't have to do it. This is just sunnah, I don't have to do it. No, because sometimes something may be sunnah and not fard, but sometimes, sometimes something may be sunnah and also fard at the same time, right? So you have to look at the definition here. And you have to make sure you understand the difference between the general definition of sunnah, meaning something the Prophet ﷺ did or said or approved, and the, the specific fiqhi definition of sunnah as well. So something can be sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ said it or did it, and at the same time, it, it possibly can also be fard. Not necessarily. There are some things that are sunnah that are not fard, but there are some things that are sunnah that are fard. An example of something that is sunnah, but not fard. An example of something that is sunnah but not fard is, for example, uh, drinking water while sitting down. It was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that when he would drink, drink water, he would sit. This is sunnah, right? But it's not fard. If somebody drank water standing up, he's not committing a sin. So sometimes something can be sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ did it, but it's not fard. It's sunnah, but it's not fard. But in other cases, something may be sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ did it, and it's also fard because he commanded you to do this as well. So you have to be, be careful when, when, you know, you, when you are looking at the term sunnah, or when you're reading the term sunnah, you, know, you have to look a little, little more deep into that. Because what, what exactly is being referred to as sunnah here? What, what is the definition of sunnah that is being referred to in this context. It is, is it the general definition of sunnah or is it the fiqhi definition of sunnah? Right? So don't always think that, okay, if, if you hear, okay, this is sunnah, that means it's okay if I leave it. Don't automatically assume that because sometimes something can be sunnah but at the same time it is also obligatory. So we have to be careful about this and we have to make sure we, we, we have the correct understanding of uh, what the Prophet ﷺ said, what he did, what he approved, we have to have the correct understanding of what is obligatory upon us and what is not obligatory upon us. We have to understand uh, what actions will gain us reward. And we have to also understand which actions 
if we don't do them will cause us to be sinful which actions that if we don't do it we will be considered sinful if we don't do some actions that are wajib or fard then we're considered sinful but if we don't do actions that are just mustahab that may be sunnah but not fard if we do these actions we'll be considered you know we'll get a reward but if we don't do it we will not be considered sinful if it is not wajib or obligatory right so it it it, it you know when you when you study fiqh and usul fiqh you'll get into these terms and the and the differences in the general meanings of these terms and the the usuli fiqhi definitions of these terms there are some differences here right uh, and you know it, it's it's a subject that can get very deep but basically we just need to understand that when you hear the word sunnah it doesn't necessarily mean that this action is not obligatory sometimes that's the that's the thought that people have in their mind when they hear oh this is sunnah this is sunnah they think okay sunnah it means, you know, if I don't do it, no problem. No, because there are certain things, some things that are sunnah, but they're also obligatory. The Prophet ﷺ did it, and he commanded others to do it as well. And if you don't do it, you would be committing a sin. So it's sunnah because of the Prophet ﷺ doing it, and it's also fard because he commanded others to do it. And there are other things that are sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ may have done, but he didn't make it obligatory on people. That if you do it, it's good. You'll get reward for it, but if you don't do it, there's no problem. So these things are sunnah but not fard. So something can be sunnah and fard. It can also be sunnah and not fard. So you have to be, be very careful when, when you read the term sunnah or when you hear the term sunnah. Don't just automatically assume that, okay, it's sunnah, meaning, you know, it's not obligatory. No, not necessarily. It could be sunnah and it also could be obligatory. So you have to uh, be careful about that. All right. The next question is asking... Uh, should we eat at a restaurant that serves alcohol and yet advertises of having 100% halal meat with the certification that proves it? It's better to avoid any restaurant that serves alcohol. And it's not permissible to sit in a gathering where alcohol is being served. Right? So for sure, if, if it's a table where some people are drinking and some people are not drinking, this is haram for sure. You have to avoid this. But if it's a restaurant where alcohol is served but you know you're sitting away and you're not uh, you're not at a table where alcohol is being served and you're far away from that then still even in this situation it's better not to go to such a restaurant especially if you have other choices available if you have other restaurants available that do not serve anything haram at all then you should go to those restaurants right but if someone happens to be living in a land where maybe there are no halal uh, no no muslim owned restaurants and you know, the only restaurants that are available are, are restaurants that also serve alcohol, right? In a, in a situation where a person really doesn't have uh, a chance or an opportunity to go to a restaurant that is completely halal, and, he, you know, the only choices that are available in his country or in his land are restaurants that also serve haram things. In this situation, the scholars have said that as long as he's not at a table where the alcohol is being served as long as he's far away from it and as long as none of the people who are, are with him are drinking or are being served alcohol as long as he's away from it then you know because of necessity in some situations it's, it's allowed to go in such a restaurant as long as you're staying away from the haram things that they're serving and that's not coming to your table or it's not coming close to you and it's not uh, you know no one in your gathering no one who is with you is is drinking or ordering anything that is haram. So in cases of necessity where there are not other options, then the scholars have said that it's permissible. But if there are other options, then of course you should avoid going to such establishments and you should make sure that you only go to restaurants where nothing haram is served. Alright, the next question is asking, if a family has only three daughters and no son, then how to share the heritage if both parents passed away? Is it true that the heritage of jewelry also is shared with the mother's sister uh, besides daughters and property has to be given away to cousins? All right. So, you know, the questioner is not completely clear regarding uh, how many people have been left behind. Mentions three daughters and it mentions mother's sisters. 
but it doesn't mention, okay, does the mother have sisters? Does she have brothers too? Are there, you know, is there anyone else involved? Right? So I can't give a, a, a detailed answer regarding this. But in general, if a person had three daughters and no sons, if a person had three daughters and no sons, then in this situation, the three daughters would get two-thirds of the total wealth. Right? And that includes all of the wealth. It includes, you know, the property, the jewelry, whatever it is. Those daughters, those three daughters, they would get a total of two-thirds of the value of everything that has been left behind. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُوصِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ فَإِن كُنَّ نِسَاءً فَوْقَ اثْنَتَيْنِ فَلَهُنَّ ثُلُثَا مَا تَرَكْ That if the children that are left behind are daughters and they are more than two, right? فَإِن كُنَّ نِسَاءً فَوْقَ اثْنَتَيْنِ And in this situation you said three daughters. So these three daughters, they would get a total of two-thirds of the inheritance. They would get two-thirds. And the remaining one-third would go to the other inheritors, whoever they are. Now this questioner mentions mothers, the mother has sisters. So if the mother died and she had these three, let's say the mother died. And she had three daughters and she also had some sisters. The three daughters, they would get, uh, collectively they would get a total of two-thirds of the wealth. Divided equally amongst those three daughters. So take two-thirds of the wealth and divide those two-thirds equally amongst uh, those three daughters. So basically each one would get uh, two-ninths. Each daughter would get two-ninths. Because two-ninths times three, it becomes two-thirds. So two-thirds would go to those three daughters, each daughter getting two-ninths, two-ninths, two-ninths. Now one-third would be remaining. If the mother has sisters, then that one-third, it would be divided amongst those sisters. She doesn't mention if she has brothers, right? If she had brothers and sisters, then, then the one-third, it would go to them. It would go to them, the brothers and the sisters. But uh, the questioner doesn't mention any brothers here. So let's say it's only sisters. So those, that one-third that's remaining, it would go to the sisters. And nothing would go to the uh, cousins in this case the cousins of those three daughters let's say the mother had sisters and those sisters had children those children the children of the sister of the mother would get nothing because the sisters are still alive so they would block the uh, their children they would block their children from getting anything if the mother has her sisters and her sisters are alive then that prevents uh, the sister's children or the brother's children from getting anything. So basically, you know, this question, like I mentioned, doesn't have all of the details, but it just mentions that a person passed away, had three daughters, uh, and the mother had sisters. The mother passed away, she had three daughters, and she had some sisters. So if this is, if this is the extent of, of the inheritors, the mother, she died, she has three daughters, and she has sisters, the three daughters would get two-thirds, and the sisters, they would get one-third. The sisters would get the remaining one-third. And if there's one sister, she would get one-third. If it's two sisters, each sister would get one-sixth, right? If it's three sisters, each sister would get one-ninth. So basically, it would be divided equally amongst, the one-third that's remaining would be divided equally amongst those sisters, right? And the daughters, the three daughters, their cousins, they would get nothing. Because the mother has sisters who are alive and the sisters, you know, would block uh, the ch their children from getting anything. The fact that the sisters are alive meaning, means that the sisters' children would not get anything. Right? So that's, that's, you know, just a basic explanation. But if you want, uh, you know, if you want a more, a more detailed explanation regarding this, if you want to send an email with, uh, you know, uh, exactly how many people are involved in this, then inshallah we can give you a more detailed answer. Next questioner is asking, is it true that Allah loves odd numbers? There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna allaha witrun yuhibbul witra fa'awtiru ya ahla al-Qur'an. That surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is single, he's, he is one, and one is an odd number. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna allaha witrun, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means Allah is one, and one is an odd number. Yuhibbul witra, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves odd numbers. 
because he is one and one is an odd number. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَأَوْتِرُوا يَا أَهْلَ الْقُرْآنِ O people of the Qur'an, pray the witr prayer. So end your prayer in the night with an odd number. So if you're praying the night prayer, you're praying tahajjud for example, you're praying two by two. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, how much ever you want to pray. Two by two. And that's always going to be an even number. When you're praying two by two, it's always going to be even. But in the end, when you're finished praying, you should end it with witr. You should end it with an odd number. So that the total number, it will be odd. So for example, when we pray, when we pray taraweeh in Ramadan, right? We pray two by two and we pray 20 raka'at. Then we pray the witr prayer, three witr. So the total becomes what? It becomes 23. It becomes an odd number. So end it with an odd number. End it with the witr so that the total number, it becomes witr. Next question is asking, I have heard that the Prophet ﷺ could see behind him in prayer. Is it true? Yes, this is true. And this is from the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, gave the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, when he would be leading the prayer, before he would start the prayer, once he said to his companions, Aqimu Sufuf, that straighten the lines. فَإِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ خَلْفَ ظَهْرِي Because surely I see you from behind my back. I can see you. So the Prophet ﷺ, even though he's facing the front and the companions are behind him, he said to them, فَإِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ خَلْفَ ظَهْرِي I can see you behind my back. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet ﷺ the ability to see his companions and to, to make sure that you know, their prayer was correct, even though the Prophet ﷺ was facing the other direction. So this is one of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa In another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said to his companions, هَلْ تَرَوْنَ قِبْلَةِ هَا هُنَا Do you see my qibla here? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he would be praying towards the qibla and he would be in the front. هَلْ تَرَوْنَ قِبْلَةِ هَا هُنَا Do you see my qibla here? فَوَاللَّهِ لَا يَخْفَى عَلَيَّ خُشُوعُكُمْ وَلَا رُكُوعُكُمْ وَإِنِّي لَأَرَاكُمْ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِي so he said that, you know, even though I'm praying in, in, and praying towards the direction of the Qibla and you are behind me, Wallahi, your khushu' in your prayer, your dedication in your prayer, your focus in your prayer, and your ruku' your bowing down in your prayer, it is not hidden from me. I can see it. فَإِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ وَرَاءَ ظَهْرِي For surely I see you from behind my back. I can see you from behind my back. So yes, this is, this is something that is authentic. And it is one of the miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Next questioner is asking for the loud prayers. Should the woman also pray loudly while praying at home? Yes. If it's a loud prayer like Fajr or Maghrib or Isha, then if a woman is praying at home by herself or if she's, if she's praying, you know, with other women, she's making a jama'ah with other women, then it is recommended for her to recite loudly. This is fine. But if she's praying in a situation where there are uh, ajnab, ajnabi men, non-mahram men who are around, then it's better for her to not recite loudly and to recite quietly. But if she's at home and she's praying by herself, or if she's praying and there, the only men are, that are around are mahram men, or she's praying with a group of women and she's leading them, then yes, sure, she should... Uh, she should recite loudly, inshallah. And this is, this is good and this is recommended. But if she didn't do it, there's no sin. It's fine. But uh, it's good and recommended if she does do it, inshallah. Next question is asking, can one donate the lifetime savings set aside for hajj to someone or a group of uh, people desperately in need of financial help? If so, what should this person do if he knows that he might not be able to come up with the amount to perform hajj as he is getting old if it is money that he has for his obligatory hajj he has not performed hajj before and now he has saved up enough money to make hajj then that is what should be given priority rather than giving sadaqa to people unless they are people whom he is obliged to spend upon Unless there are people that it is obligatory for him to spend upon. Like for example, if it's his, his child, right? And his child, something happened that, you know, there's, there's a big expense that he has to take care of for his child. Then yes, it's obligatory for you to spend upon your child. So yes, you can use that money for that. Your parents, your parents have some, you know, financial need. And you're the only one 
who can help them out with this, right? It's obligatory for you to spend on your parents. So if they have some need for that, then you spend on them. So if it's someone that is obligatory for you to spend upon, then yes, you can use that money for that. But if it's someone that is not obligatory for you to spend upon, you have not made hajj, now you have enough money for hajj. And, you know, you see a charitable project and you want to participate in that, right? So this is not someone who is obligatory for you to spend upon. It's good for you to spend, right? Like, you know, you see, for example, uh, you know, you want to spend on, on refugees or you want to spend on relief projects in another country or something like that. Where, where, it's, where it's good for you to spend and you'll get rewarded for spending on these people but it's not an obligation specifically upon you to spend in this way. This is something that is, is, is extra for you. It's not fard for you. But the hajj is fard for you. So of course in this situation the hajj has to take priority. If you have this money set aside then you should go and make hajj and by doing that you would be fulfilling your obligation which is a pillar of Islam. So fulfilling your obligation, and one of the most important obligations of Islam, one of the pillars of Islam, of course this takes precedence over uh, sadaqah that is optional, that is not obligatory upon you specifically, right? So it depends. If it's a person who you're obligated to spend upon, like your child or your mother or your father, then yes, you can use that money to spend upon them if they need it. But if it's, if it's not someone whom you are specifically obligated to spend upon, then no, that money that you have for hajj, you should make hajj with it and fulfill your obligation. All right, the next questioner is asking, if a couple decided to adopt or raise an orphan, when does hijab become mandatory for a wife in front of the child if the child is a male? And also, when should a husband start practicing physical distancing if the kid happens to be a female? All right, so of course... When, when the child starts to become aware of, you know, the, the differences between men and women, right? When the child reaches, reaches that age where he can, he can basically understand, you know, the feelings that men have towards women and the women have, that women have towards men. When he starts getting that type of awareness, that is when... Uh, a woman should start wearing hijab in front of a boy, right? When he starts getting that awareness of the attraction that men have for women and women have for men, right? That is when a woman should start wearing a hijab in front of uh, a boy, right? And as for uh, if the child that you're raising is a, is a girl, then basically the same rule would apply to, you know, the, the father keeping a distance away from the girl that you know once the, the age is reached where you know the girl is able to understand you know the 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 difference between men and women and the attraction that men have for women and the attraction that women have for men once you know these feelings start to to develop in a person that is when these rules should start to be observed uh, one way you know this and this of course it can cause you know some difficulties in families of course you know if uh, you know, if, if you're used to raising a child in your own household, right, and then suddenly the relationship changes because the child grows older, it can cause some tension. Uh, so one solution is if the child is adopted at a young age, if the child is adopted at an age under the age of two, under the age of two, if the wife or if the, the, the adoptive mother, basically, if she can breastfeed the child, whether the child is a boy or a girl, if she can breastfeed the child, if he's under the age of two, she breast, breastfeeds him, you know, at least 10 times, then that would establish a mahram relationship, right? So if the child is a boy, then if the mother, you know, if the woman breastfed this child when he was under the age of two at least 10 times, then it's like, he's, it's like this woman becomes uh, this, this boy's mother now. So they're mahram forever now. So they don't have to worry about, you know, she doesn't ever have to worry about wearing hijab in front of him or nothing like that, right? So that solves that problem. If the child is a girl, if the child is a girl and the, the woman breastfeeds the child before she reaches the age of two and she breastfeeds the, the girl at least 10 times before the age of two, then this girl would also become a, a, a mahram to the foster mother's or the milk mother's husband as well. 
So the, the, the husband of the woman who fed this girl milk becomes like her father. So he becomes her mahram as well. So this is a solution, whether the child is a boy or a girl, if the child is adopted at an age under the age of two, and the woman can breastfeed the child, then inshallah, uh, this, would, this would basically establish a mahram relationship and you know, it, it, it would solve any of these type of issues that could arise in the future. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Next questioner is asking, could the couple include uh, the adopted child in their will giving him or her equal share of inheritance as their biological children? All right, so adopted children are not inheritors. They do not inherit. They do not inherit from the people who adopted them. But it would be permissible for you to leave up to one third of your wealth to a non-inheritor. You're allowed to leave up to one third of your, health, of your wealth to a non-inheritor, like a charity or a friend or anyone who's a non-inheritor. You can leave up to the maximum one third of your wealth to a non-inheritor. So these children, orphan children that you may be raising, they are considered non-inheritors. But if you want to leave them something, then yes, you can write that in your will, up to one third. You know, uh, one third is the maximum, but if you want it to be less than one third, that's okay. If you want it to be up to one third, that's okay. You know, you can leave this to uh, a non-inheritor and that would include these children. So, so that, that's a way that you can leave something for them as well, inshallah. And the last questioner is asking, what should one do if the same surah was repeat, repeated twice in salah? You don't have to do anything. This is fine. If somebody recited the same surah after Surah Al-Fatiha in the first rakah, and then they did the same surah again in the second rakah, it's fine. Your salah is valid. You don't have to do anything. Uh, and there's actually a hadith from Mu'adh ibn Abdullah al-Juhani, radiyallahu an, uh, where he mentions, أَنَّهُ سَمِعَ رَجُلًا مِنَ الْجُهَيْنَةِ قال أنه سمع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقرأ إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها في الصبح في الركعتين كلتيهما. That this man from Juhayna told told Muaz ibn Abdullah al Juhani that he heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم recite إذا زلزلت الأرض زلزالها in both rakaat of the Fajr prayer. So in the first rak'ah of Fajr, he, he read Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and then after that إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا Then in the second rak'ah, after Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, again he read إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا So this establishes the permissibility of repeating the same surah in the first rak'ah and the second rak'ah. So there's no problem in your salah if you did this. Your salah is valid and you do not have to do anything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Wallahu alam. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.